From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the 180th semi-annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church, and music for this session by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Members and officers of the church have come from all areas of the world to receive counsel and instruction from their church leaders. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Henry B. Eyring, first counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the first session of the 180th semi-annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and extend a special welcome to members and friends participating here in the Conference Center and throughout the world, wherever you may be. President Thomas S. Monson, who presides at this conference, has asked that I conduct this session. We acknowledge the general authorities and the general auxiliary presidencies in attendance at this conference. We are grateful to the many television and radio stations and satellite and cable systems for offering their facilities as a public service to bring this conference to a large audience in many areas of the world. The music for this session will be by the Tabernacle Choir under the direction of Mac Wilberg and Ryan Murphy with Clay Christiansen and Andrew Emsworth at the organ. The choir opened this session by singing, Guide us, O Thou Great Jehovah, and will now favor us with Let Zion in Her Beauty Rise. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Octaviano Tenorio of the Seventy. Yeah. 
our Father in heaven, we are very grateful for thy Son, Jesus Christ. We are very grateful for the blessings we receive from thee. We are so grateful for thy church and the living prophets we have in our day. As we begin the, the first session of this conference, we ask thee to speak to our minds and hearts through the Holy Ghost, the messages prepared for this session. We ask thee to help us ponder and put into practice the counsel we received this morning for our eternal welfare and that of our families. Father, please bless President Thomas Monson, our dear prophet, with health, strength, and inspiration, that we may hear thy holy word through him, be attentive to it, and obey it. Please help him fill our love. We ask this, we ask this things in the blessed name of thy Son, our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. We shall now be pleased to hear from our beloved prophet, President Thomas S. Monson. Following his remarks, the choir will sing, We Thank Thee, O God, for a Prophet. At the conclusion of the singing, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will address us, and he will be followed by Sister Rosemary Wixom, Primary General President. Following her remarks, Elder Claudio R. M. Costa of the Presidency of the Seventy will address us. President Monson. My beloved brothers and sisters, we welcome you to General Conference which is being heard and seen by various means throughout the world. We express thanks to all who have to do with the complicated logistics of this great undertaking. Since April, when last we met, the work of the Church has moved forward unhindered. It's been my privilege to dedicate four new temples, accompanied by my counselors and other general authorities. I've traveled to Gila Valley, Arizona, to Vancouver, British Columbia, to Cebu City in the Philippines, and to Kyiv, Ukraine. The temples in each of these locations are magnificently beautiful. Each one is blessing the lives of our members and is an influence for good upon those not of our faith. The evening prior to each temple dedication, we were privileged to view a cultural celebration participated in by our young people and some of our uh, not-so-young people. <laughs> These events were generally held in large stadiums. Although in Kyiv, we met in a beautiful palace. The dancing, singing, musical performances, and the displays were excellent. I express my commendation and love to all who were involved. Each temple dedication was a spiritual feast. We felt the Spirit of the Lord at all of them. Next month, we will dedicate the Laie, Hawaii Temple, one of our oldest temples, which has undergone extensive renovations during many months. We look forward to that sacred occasion. We continue to build temples. This morning, I am pleased to announce five additional temples for which sites are being acquired and which in coming months and years will be built in the following locations. Lisbon, Portugal. Indianapolis, Indiana. Doneta, Philippines. Hartford, Connecticut. And Tijuana, Mexico. The ordinances performed in our temples are vital to our salvation and to the salvation of our deceased loved ones. May we continue faithful in attending the temples which are being built closer 
and closer to our members. Now, before we hear from our speakers this morning, may I mention a matter close to my heart and which deserves our serious attention. I speak of missionary work. First, two young men of the Aaronic Priesthood, and to you young men who are becoming elders, I repeat what prophets have long taught, that every worthy, able young man should prepare to serve a mission. Missionary service is a priesthood duty, an obligation the Lord expects of us who have been given so very much. Young men, I admonish you to prepare for service as a missionary. Keep yourselves clean and pure and worthy to represent the Lord. Maintain your health and strength. Study the scriptures, where such is available. Participate in seminary or institute. Familiarize yourself with a missionary handbook. Preach my gospel. A word to you, young sisters, while you do not have the same priesthood responsibility as do the young men to serve as full-time missionaries, you also make a valuable contribution as missionaries, and we welcome your service. And now do you mature? Brothers and sisters, we need many, many more senior couples. <laughs> to the faithful couples now serving or who have served in the past, we thank you for your faith and devotion to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You serve willingly and well and accomplish great good. To those of you who are not yet to the season of life when you might serve a couple's mission, I urge you to prepare now for the day when you and your spouse might do so. As your circumstances allow, as you are eligible for retirement, and as your health permits, make yourselves available to leave home and give full-time missionary service. There are few times in your lives when you will enjoy the sweet spirit and satisfaction that come from giving full-time service together in the work of the Master. Now, my brothers and sisters, may you be attuned to the Spirit of the Lord as we hear from His servants during the next two days, that this may be the blessing of each. I pray humbly, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
President Monson, the entire worldwide membership of this church joins in that great anthem by this wonderful choir, and we say we thank thee, O God, for a prophet. Thank you for your life, for your example, and for that welcoming message to another general conference of the Church. We love you, we admire you, and we sustain you. Indeed, in this afternoon's session, we'll have a more formal opportunity to raise our hands in a sustaining vote, not only for President Monson, but also for all the other general officers of the Church as well. Because my name will be included on that list, may I be so bold as to speak for all in thanking you in advance for those uplifted hands. Not one of us could serve without your prayers and without your support. Your loyalty and your love mean more to us than we can ever possibly say. In that spirit, my message today is to say that we sustain you that we return to you those same heartfelt prayers and that same expression of love. We all know there are special keys, and covenants, and responsibilities given to the presiding officers of the Church. But we also know that the Church draws incomparable strength, a truly unique vitality, from the faith and devotion of every member of this Church, whoever you may be. In whatever country you live, however young or inadequate you feel, or however aged or limited you see yourself as being, I testify you are individually loved of God. You are central to the meaning of His work, and you are cherished and prayed for by the presiding officers of His Church. The personal value, the sacred splendor of every one of you is the very reason there is a plan of salvation and exaltation. Contrary to the parlance of the day, this is about you. No, don't turn and look at your neighbor. I'm talking to you. I've struggled to find an adequate way to tell you how loved of God you are and how grateful we on this stand are for you. I am trying to be voice for the very angels of heaven in thanking you for every good thing you have ever done, for every kind word you've ever said, for every sacrifice you've ever made in extending to someone, to anyone, the beauty and blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm grateful for young women leaders who go to girls' camp and without shampoo or showers or mascara turn smoky campfire testimony meetings into some of the most riveting spiritual experiences those girls or those leaders will experience in their lifetime. I'm grateful for all the women of the Church who in my life have been as strong as Mount Sinai and as compassionate as the Mount of Beatitudes. We smile sometimes about our sisters' stories, you know, green jello quilts and funeral potatoes. But my family has been the grateful recipient of each of those items at one time or another, and in one case, the quilt and the funeral potatoes on the same day. It was just a small quilt, tiny really, to make my deceased baby brother's journey back to his heavenly home as warm and comfortable as our Relief Society sisters wanted him to be. The food provided for our family after the service, voluntarily given without a single word from us, was gratefully received. Smile, if you will, about our traditions, but somehow the too often unheralded women in this Church are always there when hands hang down and knees are feeble. They seem to grasp instinctively the divinity in Christ's declaration inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, ye have done it unto me." And no less the brethren of the priesthood. I think, for example, of the leaders of our young men 
who, depending on the climate and continent, either take bone-rattling 50-mile hikes or dig and actually try to sleep in ice caves for what have to be the longest nights of human experience. <laughs> I'm grateful for memories of my own high priest group a few years ago who took turns for weeks sleeping on a small recliner in the bedroom of a dying quorum member's home so that his aged and equally fragile wife could get some sleep through those final weeks of her sweetheart's life. I'm grateful for the Church's army of teachers, officers, advisors, and clerks to say nothing of people who are forever setting up tables and taking down chairs. I'm grateful for ordained patriarchs, musicians, family historians, and osteoporotic couples who trundle off to the temple at 5 o'clock in the morning with little suitcases now almost bigger than they are. <laughs> I am grateful for selfless parents who, perhaps for a lifetime, care for a challenged child. Sometimes with more than one challenge and sometimes with more than one child. I'm grateful for children who close ranks later in life to give back to ill or aging parents. And to the near-perfect elderly sister who almost apologetically recently whispered to me, I've never been a leader of anything in the Church. I guess I've only been a helper. I say, dear sister, God bless you. And thank heaven for all the helpers in the kingdom. Some of us who are leaders hope someday to have the standing before God you've already attained. Too often I have failed to express gratitude for the faith and goodness of such people in my life. President James E. Faust stood at this pulpit 13 years ago and said, as a small boy, I remember my grandmother cooking our delicious, me delicious meals on a hot wood stove. When the wood box next to the stove became empty, grandmother would silently go out to refill it from the pile of cedar wood and bring the heavily laden box back into the house. I was so insensitive, President Faust said, that I sat there and let my beloved grandmother refill that box. Then, his voice choking with emotion, he said, I feel ashamed of myself and have regretted my omission for all of my life. I hope someday to ask for her forgiveness. If a man as perfect as I felt President Faust was can acknowledge his youthful oversight, I can do no less than make a similar admission and pay a long overdue tribute of my own today. When I was called to serve a mission back before the dawn of time, <laughs> there was no equalization of missionary costs. Each had to bear the full expense of the mission to which he or she was sent. Some missions were very expensive, and as it turned out, mine was one of those. As we encouraged missionaries to do, I had saved money and sold personal belongings to pay my own way as best I could. I thought I had enough money, but wasn't sure exactly how it would be in the final months of the mission. But with that question on my mind, I nevertheless blissfully left my family for the greatest experience anyone could hope to have. I loved my mission, as I am sure no young man has ever loved one before or since. Then I returned home just as my parents were called to serve a mission of their own. What do I do now? How in the world could I pay for a college education? How can I possibly pay for board and room? And how could I realize the great dream of my heart to marry the breathtakingly perfect Patricia Terry? I don't mind admitting that I was discouraged and frightened. Hesitantly, I went to the local bank and asked the manager, a family friend, how much was in my account? He looked surprised and said, Well, Jeff, it's all in your account. 
Didn't they tell you? Your parents wanted to do what little they could to help you get started when you got home. They didn't withdraw a cent during your mission. I supposed that you knew. Well, I didn't know. What I do know is that my dad, a self-educated accountant, a bookkeeper, as they were called in our little town, with very few clients, probably never wore a new suit or a new shirt or a new pair of shoes for two years so his son could have all of those for his mission. Furthermore, what I did not know but then came to know was that my mother, who had never worked out of the home in her married life, took a job at a local department store so that my mission exp expenses could be met. And not one word of that was ever conveyed to me on my mission. Not a single word was said regarding any of it. How many fathers in this church have done exactly what my father did? And how many mothers in these difficult economic times are still doing what my mother did? My father's been gone for 34 years, so like President Faust, I'll have to wait to fully thank him on the other side. But my sweet mother, who turns 95 next week, is happily watching this broadcast at her home today in St. George. So it's not too late to thank her. To you, Mom and Dad, and to all the moms and dads and families and faithful people everywhere, I thank you for sacrificing for your children and for other people's children, for wanting so much to give them advantages you never had, for wanting so much to give them the happiest life you could provide. My thanks to all you wonderful members of the Church and legions of good people not of our faith for proving every day of your life that the pure love of Christ never faileth. No one of you is insignificant, in part because you make the gospel of Jesus Christ what it is, a living reminder of His grace and mercy, a private but powerful manifestation in small villages and large cities of the good He did and the life He gave, bringing peace and salvation to other people. We are honored beyond expression to be counted one with you in such a sacred cause. As Jesus said to the Nephites, so say I today. Because of your faith, my joy is full. And when he had said these words, he wept. Brothers and sisters, seeing your example, I pledge anew my determination to be better, to be more faithful, more kind and devoted, more charitable and true as our Father in Heaven is and as so many of you already are. This I pray in the name of our great exemplar in all things, even the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I recently observed the birth of tiny Kate Elizabeth. After she entered this world and was placed into her mother's arms, Kate reached out and caught hold of her mother's finger. It was as if little Kate were saying, If I hold on, will you help me stay on the path back to my Heavenly Father? At age seven, Joseph Smith contracted typhoid fever and an infection settled in his leg. 
Dr. Nathan Smith was pioneering a procedure by which the infected leg could be saved. Without anesthesia, Dr. Smith would need to cut his leg and actually remove portions of the infected bone. Joseph declined brandy and en and endure to endure the pain and refused to be tied down, but said, I will have my father sit on the bed and hold me in his arms, and then I will do whatever is necessary. For children all over the world, we say, Take my hand. Hold on tight. We will stay on the path together back to our Heavenly Father. Parents, grandparents, neighbors, friends, primary leaders, each of us can reach out to hold on to the children. We can stop, kneel down, look into their eyes, and feel of their innate desire to follow the Savior. Take hold of their hands, walk with them. It's our chance to anchor them on the path of faith. No child needs to walk the path alone so long as we speak freely to our children of the plan of salvation. Understanding the plan will help them hold to the truth that they are children of God and that He has a plan for them and that they lived with Him in the pre-mortal existence, that they shouted for joy to come to this earth, and that through the Savior's help, we all can return to our Heavenly Father's presence. If they understand the plan and who they are, they will not fear. In Alma 24, we read, He loveth our souls and He loveth our children. Therefore, the plan of salvation might be made known unto us as well as unto future generations. We begin to make the plan known to our children when we hold tight to the iron rod ourselves. When we are holding tight to the iron rod, we are in a position to place our hands over theirs and walk the straight and narrow path together. Our example is magnified in their eyes, and they will follow our cadence when they feel secure in our actions. We do not need to be perfect, just honest and sincere. Children want to feel as one with us. When a parent says, we can do it, we can read the scriptures daily as a family. The children will follow. One such family with four young children writes, We decided to start small because of our children's short attention spans. Our oldest child was not yet reading, but she could repeat our words. So we began reading the Book of Mormon just three verses each night. My husband and I would read one verse each, and then Sidney would repeat a verse. We progressed to four verses and then five verses as the boys began to repeat their own verses. Yes, it was tedious, but we kept going. We tried to focus on consistency instead of speed. It took us three and a half years to finish the Book of Mormon. It was a great feeling of accomplishment. The mother continues, Daily family scripture reading is a habit in our family now, and our children are comfortable with scriptural language. My husband and I take opportunity to bear testimony of truth. But most important, the Spirit has increased in our home. Do you take from this family's experience what I do? When our intent is to hold tight to the Word of God, our reading of the scriptures can be just one verse at a time, and it's never too late to begin. You can start now. The world will teach our children if we do not, and children are capable of learning all the world will teach them at a very young, young age. What we want them to know five years from now needs to be part of our conversation with them today. Teach them in every circumstance. Let every dilemma, every consequence, every trial that they may face provide an opportunity to teach them 
how to hold on to gospel truths. Shannon, a young mother, did not expect that she would teach her children the power of prayer when they piled into their van to drive to their home just 40 minutes away. There was no storm when they left their grandmother's home, but as they began to drive through the canyon, the light snow turned into a blizzard. The van began sliding on the surface of the road, and soon visibility was near zero. The two youngest children could sense the stress of the situation and began to cry. Shannon said to the older children, Heidi and Thomas, ages eight and six, you need to pray. We need Heavenly Father's help to get home safely. Pray that we will not get stuck and that we will not slide off the road. Her hand shook as she steered the car, yet she could hear the whisper of little prayers repeatedly coming from the back seat. Heavenly Father, please help us to get home safely. Please help us so we will not slide off the road. In time, the prayers calmed the two little ones, and they stopped their crying just as they learned that a road closure prevented them from driving any farther. Cautiously, they turned around and found a motel for the night. Once in the motel, they knelt down and thanked Heavenly Father for their safety. That night, a mother taught her children the power of holding true to prayer. What trials will our children face? Like Joseph Smith, our children can find the courage to do whatever is necessary. When we are intentional about holding them and teaching them of Heavenly Father's plan through prayer and scriptures, they will come to know where they came from, why they are here, and where they are going. Last spring, my husband and I attended a soccer game of our four-year-old grandson. You could feel the excitement on the field as the players ran in every direction, chasing the soccer ball. When the final whistle blew, the players were unaware of who won or who lost. They had simply played the game. The coaches directed the players to shake hands with the opposing team members. Then I observed something quite remarkable. The coach called for a victory tunnel. All the parents, grandparents, and any spectators who had come to observe the game stood up and formed two lines facing each other, and by raising their arms, they formed an arch. The children squealed as they ran through the cheering adults and down the path formed by the spectators. Soon, the children from the opposing team joined the fun as all the players, the winners and the losers, were cheered on by the adults as they ran the path of the victory tunnel. In my mind's eye, I had another picture. I had the feeling I was seeing children living the plan, the plan Heavenly Father has created for each individual child. They were running the straight and narrow path through the arms of the spectators who loved them, each one feeling the joy of being on the path. Jacob said, Oh, how great the plan of our God! The Savior has marked the path and led the way. I testify that as we hold on to our children and follow the Savior's lead, we will all return to our heavenly home and be safe in our Heavenly Father's arms. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I am a convert to the Church. I am so grateful that God answered my prayer and gave me a knowledge and a strong testimony that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. Before I made the decision to be baptized in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I studied the extracts from the history of Joseph Smith. I prayed after carefully reading each paragraph. If you would like to do this yourself, it may take you 14 hours. After I read, pondered, and prayed, 
the Lord gave me the assurance that Joseph Smith was his prophet. I testify to you that Joseph Smith is a prophet. And because I have received this answer from the Lord, I know that all of his successors are prophets too. What a great blessing it is to have prophets in our day. Why is it important to have living prophets to guide the true Church of Jesus Christ and its members? In the guide to the scriptures, we find the definition of the word prophet, a person called by God to speak in his name. As a messenger of the Lord, the prophet receives commandments, prophecies, and revelations from God. It is a great blessing to receive the word, commandments, and guidance of the Lord in these difficult days of the earth. The prophet can be inspired to see the future in benefit of mankind. We are told that surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealed his secret unto his servants, the prophets. We learn from this scripture that the Lord will reveal to his prophets absolutely anything that he feels is necessary to communicate to us. He will reveal his will to us, and he will instruct us through his prophets. The Lord promised us that if we believe in the holy prophets, we should have eternal life. And the sixth article of faith, we declare that we believe in prophets. To believe means to have a faith and confidence in them, and to follow and do what the prophets ask us to do. In 1980, when President Ezra Taft Benson was serving as president of the Council of the Twelve Apostles, he gave a powerful message about obedience to the prophets at a BYU devotional in the Marriott Center. His great talk titled, 14 Fundamentals in Following the Prophet Touch My Heart. It made me feel good that I had made the decision to follow the prophets for the rest of my life when I accepted baptism in the Lord through church. I would like to share with you some of the principles that President Benson taught. First, the prophet is the only man who speaks for the Lord in everything. In our day, the prophet of God has told us to keep the commandments, to love our fellow men, to serve, to take care of the rising generation, to rescue the inactive or less active, to do many things that we call prophetic priorities. We needed to understand that these priorities are God's priorities, and the prophet is his voice in communicating it to all of the church and the world. We are counseled to give heed unto all his words and commandments. We also learn for his word ye shall receive as if from mine own mouth, in all patience and faith. For by doing these things, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yea, and the Lord God will disperse the powers of darkness from before you, and cause the heavens to shake for your good and his name's glory. Second fundamental. The living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works. The living prophet is receiving specific revelations for us. I can remember many times when I have been present to hear one of the servants of the Lord speak about a specific thing for a city or a country. I remember at least three of the living prophets, seers, and revelators who had who have spoke about my country, Brazil. One of these servants said that Brazil would become a great economy in the world, to be free of inflation. At the time, we had a two-digit inflation every month. It was difficult for many people to believe what the prophet said, but I believe it. Brazil has had about 5% inflation each year 
for many consecutive years now. Brazil has become ninth in the world economy, and the country is doing great. Third fundamental, the living prophet is more important to us than the dead prophet. We learn a great lesson about this from the scriptures. In the times of Noah, it was easier for the people to believe in, in the dead prophets, but it was difficult for them to believe in Noah. We know that because of their incredulity, they did not survive the flood. Fourth fundamental, the prophet will never lead the church astray. Again, we learn from the living prophets. President Wilford Woodruff said, the Lord will never permit me or any other man who stands as president of this church to lead you astray. It is not in the program. It is not in the mind of God. If I were to attempt that, the Lord would remove me out of my place. And so he will any other man who attempts to lead the children of men astray from the oracles of God and from their duty. Fifth fundamental, the prophet is not required to have any particular earthly training or credentials to speak on any subject or act on any matter at any time. The Lord called a young man, Joseph Smith, to restore his church. Do you think that the young Joseph Smith was a doctor in theology or science? We know that he was a humble and not academically educated young man, but he was chosen by the Lord, and he received from the Lord all that was necessary to honor and magnify the calling of a prophet of the Restoration. President Benson continued, Sixth, the prophet does not have to say, thus said the Lord to give us scripture. Seventh, the prophet tells us what we need to know, not always what we want to know. And then President Benson quoted from 1 Nephi 16, 1 and 3. And now it came to pass that after I, Nephi, had made an end of speaking to my brethren, behold, they said unto me, Thou hast declared unto us hard things, more than we are able to bear. And now, my brethren, if ye were righteous and were willing to hearken to the truth and give heed unto it, that ye might walk uprightly before God, then ye would not murmur because of the truth and say, Thou speakest hard things against us. Eighth fundamental, the prophet is not limited by man's reasoning. Thus, it seemed reasonable to cure leprosy by telling a man to wash him seven times in a particular river, yet this is precisely what the prophet Elijah told the leper to do, and he was healed. And President Benson continued giving other principles about obedience to the prophet. I will read the last six and invite you in your next family home evening to find these principles and the words and teachings of our living prophet, seers, and revelators during this general conference. Ninth, the prophet can receive a revelation on any matter, temporal or spiritual. Tenth, the prophet may be involved in civic matters. Eleventh, the two groups who have the greatest difficulty in following the prophet are the proud who are learned and the proud who are rich. Twelfth, the prophet will not necessarily be popular with the world or the worldly. Thirteenth, the prophet and his counselors make up the first presidency of first presence, the highest quorum in the church. Fourteenth, the prophet and the presidency, the living prophet and the first presidency, follow then and be blessed, reject then and suffer. We are privileged to have the words of our living prophets, seers, and revelators during this wonderful general conference. They will speak the will of the Lord for us, his people. They will transmit the word of God and his counsel to us. Pay attention and follow their instructions and suggestions, and I testify to you that your life will be completely blessed. 
Jesus is the Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. Thomas S. Monson is the living prophet of God. And the first presidency and quorum of the twelve apostles are prophets, seers, and revelators. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The choir and congregation will now join in singing Put Your Shoulder to the Wheel. At the conclusion of the singing, Brother David McConkie, first counselor in the Sunday School General Presidency, will address us, after which we shall hear from Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. The choir will then sing Tell me the stories of Jesus. This is the 180th semi-annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As a member of the General Sunday School Presidency, I feel I should begin my remarks this morning by saying, good morning, class. My message today is to all those who have been called to teach in whatever, in whatever organization you are serving, and whether you are a recent convert to the Church or a teacher with years of experience, I am not going to talk about the how of teaching but rather about the how of learning. 
There can be a significant difference between what a teacher says and what those in the class hear or learn. Think for a moment of a teacher who really made a difference in your life. What was it about him or her that caused you to remember what was taught, to want to discover the truth for yourself, to exercise your agency and act, and not just to be acted upon? In other words, to learn. What was it about this teacher that set him or her apart from the rest? A successful teacher and author said, What matters most in learning is attitude, the attitude of the teacher. Note that what matters most in learning is not the number of years a teacher has been a member of the Church or how much teaching experience a person has or even the teacher's knowledge of the gospel or teaching techniques. What matters most is the attitude or spirit by which the teacher teaches. In a worldwide leadership training meeting, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland told this story. For many years, I have loved the story that President Packer has told about William E. Barrett's boyhood Sunday school teacher. An elderly Danish brother was called to teach a class of rowdy boys. He didn't speak the language very well. He still had a heavy Danish brogue. He was much older with big farm hands. Yet he was to teach these young, rambunctious 15-year-olds. For all intents and purposes, it would not have seemed like a very good match. But Brother Barrett used to say, and this is the part President Packer quotes, that this man somehow taught them that across all those barriers, across all those limitations, this man reached into the hearts of those rowdy 15-year-old kids and changed their lives. And Brother Barrett's testimony was, we could have warmed our hands by the fire of his faith. Successful gospel teachers love the gospel. They are excited about it. And because they love their students, they want them to feel as they feel and to experience what they have experienced. To teach the gospel is to share your love of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, a teacher's attitude is not taught, it's caught. How then do we develop the attitude necessary to be a successful teacher? I would like to discuss four basic principles of gospel teaching. First, immerse yourselves in the scriptures. We cannot love what we do not know. Develop a habit of daily scripture study separate and apart from your lesson preparation. Before we can teach the gospel, we must know the gospel. President Monson still treasures the memory of his boyhood Sunday school teacher. He said, quote, It was my experience as a small boy to come under the influence of a most effective and inspired teacher who listened to us and who loved us. Her name was Lucy Gurch. In our Sunday school class, she taught us concerning the creation of the world, the fall of Adam, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. She brought to her class as honored guests Moses, Joshua, Peter, Thomas, Paul, and of course Christ. Though we did not see them, we learned to love, honor, and emulate them." Close quote. Lucy Gurch was able to invite these honored guests into her classroom because she knew them. They were her cherished friends. Because of that, her class also learned to love, honor, and emulate them. The Lord said to Hiram Smith, Seek not to declare my word, but first seek to obtain my word. This admonition applies to each of us. The Lord has commanded us to search the scriptures, to feast upon them, and to treasure them up. As we earnestly search and ponder the word of the Lord, we will have His Spirit with us. We will become acquainted with His voice. Soon after I was called to be a stake president, our stake presidency received training from an Area 70. During the training, I asked a question to which he responded, That's a good question. Let's turn to the General Handbook of Instructions for the answer. We then went to the handbook, and there was the answer to my question. A little later in our training, I asked another question. Once again, he responded, 
Good question. Let's turn to the handbook. I did not venture to ask any more questions. <laughs> I thought it best to read the handbook. I have thought since that the Lord could give a similar response to each of us as we go to Him with questions or concerns. He could say, that's a good question. If you will review Alma chapter 5 or Doctrine and Covenants section 76, you'll remember that I have already spoken to you about this. Brothers and sisters, it is contrary to the economy of heaven for the Lord to repeat to each of us individually what He has already revealed to us collectively. The scriptures contain the words of Christ. They are the voice of the Lord. Studying the scriptures trains us to hear the Lord's voice. Second, apply in your life the things that you learn. When Hiram Smith desired to be part of this great Latter-day work, the Lord said to him, Behold, this is your work, to keep my commandments, yea, with all your might, mind, and strength. As teachers, our work first and foremost is to keep the commandments with all of our might, mind, and strength. Third, seek Heaven's help. Appeal unto the Lord for His Spirit with all the energy of your heart. The scriptures state, If you receive not the Spirit, ye shall not teach. This means that even if you use all the right teaching techniques and what you're teaching is true, without the Spirit, real learning is not going to take place. The role of the teacher is to help individuals take responsibility for learning the gospel, to awaken in them the desire to study, understand, and live the gospel. This means that as teachers, we should not focus so much on our performance as on how we help others learn and live the gospel. When was the last time you knelt in prayer and asked the Lord to help you not just with your lesson, but also to help you to know and to meet the needs of each student in your class. No class is so large that we cannot pray for inspiration regarding how to reach each student. It is natural for teachers to have feelings of inadequacy. You must understand that age and maturity and intellectual training are not in any degree or to any degree necessary to communion with the Lord and His Spirit. The promises of the Lord are certain. If you earnestly search the scriptures and treasure up in your minds the words of life, if you keep the commandments with all of your heart and pray for each student, you will enjoy the companionship of the Holy Ghost and you will receive revelation. Fourth, brothers and sisters, it is of utmost importance that we exercise our agency and act without delay in accordance with the spiritual promptings we receive. President Thomas S. Monson taught, We watch, we wait, we listen for that still, small voice. When it speaks, wise men and women obey. Promptings of the Spirit are not to be postponed." End quote. You must not be afraid to exercise your agency and act upon the thoughts and impressions that the Spirit of the Lord puts into your heart. You may feel awkward at first, but I promise you that the sweetest and most gratifying experiences that you will have as a teacher will be when you submit to the will of the Lord and follow the promptings you receive from the Holy Ghost. Your experiences will strengthen your faith and give you greater courage to act in the, futures, in the future. Dear teachers, you are one of the great miracles of this Church. You have a sacred trust. We love you and have confidence in you. I know that if you will search the scriptures and live so that we are worthy to have the companionship of the Holy Ghost, the Lord will magnify us in our callings and responsibilities so that we may accomplish our errand from the Lord. That we may all do so is my prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As a youth, I visited the 1964 World's Fair in New York City. One of my favorite stops was the LDS Church Pavilion with its impressive replica of the Salt Lake Temple Spires. 
There, for the first time, I saw the film Man's Search for Happiness. The movie's depiction of the plan of salvation, narrated by Elder Richard L. Evans, had a significant impact on many visitors, including me. Among other things, Elder Evans said, Life offers you two precious gifts. One is time. The other, freedom of choice, the freedom to buy with your time what you will. You're free to exchange your allotment of time for thrills. You may trade it for base desires. You may invest it in greed. Yours is the freedom to choose. But these are no bargains, for in them you find no lasting satisfaction. Every day, he continued, every hour, every minute of your span of mortal years must sometime be accounted for. And it is in this life that you walk by faith and prove yourself able to choose good over evil, right over wrong, enduring happiness over mere amusement. And your eternal reward will be according to your choosing. A prophet of God has said, Men are that they might have joy, a joy that includes a fullness of life, a life dedicated to service, to love, and harmony in the home in the fruits of honest toil, an acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of its requirements and commandments. Only in these, Elder Evans said, will you find true happiness, the happiness which doesn't fade with the lights and the music and the crowds. These statements express the reality that our life on earth is a stewardship of time and choices granted by our Creator. The word stewardship calls to mind the Lord's law of consecration, which has an economic role, but more than that, is an application of celestial law to life here and now. To consecrate is to set apart or dedicate something as sacred, devoted to holy purposes. True success in this life comes in consecrating our lives, that is, our time and choices, to God's purposes. In so doing, we permit Him to raise us to our highest destiny. I would like to consider with you five of the elements of a consecrated life. Purity, work, respect for one's physical body, service, and integrity. As the Savior demonstrated, the consecrated life is a pure life. While Jesus is the only one to have led a sinless life, those who come unto Him and take His yoke upon them have claim on His grace, which will make them as He is, guiltless and spotless. With deep love, the Lord encourages us in these words, Repent, all ye ends of the earth, and come unto Me, and be baptized in My name, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. Consecration, therefore, means repentance. Stubbornness, rebellion, and rationalization must be abandoned, and in their place, submission, a desire for correction, and acceptance of all that the Lord may require. This is what King Benjamin called putting off the natural man, yielding to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, and becoming a saint through the Atonement of Christ the Lord. Such a one is promised the enduring presence of the Holy Spirit, a promise remembered and renewed each time a repentant soul partakes of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Elder B. H. Roberts once expressed the process in these words, The man who so walks in the light and wisdom and power of God will at the last by the very force of association, make the light and wisdom and power of God His own, weaving those bright rays into a chain divine, linking Himself forever to God and God to Him. This is the sum of Messiah's mystic words, Thou Father in Me, and I in Thee. Beyond this, human greatness cannot achieve. A consecrated life is a life of labor. Beginning early in His life, Jesus was about His Father's business. 
God Himself is glorified by His work of bringing to pass the immortality and eternal life of His children. We naturally desire to participate with Him in His work, and in so doing, we ought to recognize that all honest work is the work of God. In the words of Thomas Carlyle, all true work is sacred. In all true work, were it but true hand labor, there is something of divineness. Labor, wide as the earth, has its summit in heaven. God has designed this mortal existence to require nearly constant exertion. I recall the Prophet Joseph Smith's simple statement, by continuous labor we were enabled to get a comfortable maintenance. By work we sustain and enrich life. It enables us to survive the disappointments and tragedies of the mortal experience. Hard-earned achievement brings a sense of self-worth. Work builds and refines character, creates beauty, and is the instrument of our service to one another and to God. A consecrated life is filled with work, sometimes repetitive, sometimes menial, sometimes unappreciated, but always work that improves, orders, sustains, lifts, ministers, aspires. Having spoken in praise of labor, I must also add a kind word for leisure. Just as honest toil gives rest its sweetness, wholesome recreation is the friend and steadying companion of work. Music, literature, art, dance, drama, athletics, all can provide entertainment to enrich one's life and further consecrate it. At the same time, it hardly needs to be said that much of what passes for entertainment today is coarse, degrading, violent, mind-numbing, and time-wasting. And I'm just getting started. <laughs> Ironically, it sometimes takes hard work to find wholesome leisure. When entertainment turns from virtue to vice, it becomes a destroyer of the consecrated life. Wherefore, take heed that ye do not judge that which is evil to be of God. A consecrated life respects the incomparable gift of one's physical body, a divine creation in the very image of God. A central purpose of the mortal experience is that each spirit should receive such a body and learn to exercise moral agency in a tabernacle of flesh. A physical body is also essential for exaltation, which comes only in the perfect combination of the physical and the spiritual, as we see in our beloved resurrected Lord. In this fallen world, some lives will be painfully brief, some bodies will be malformed, broken, or barely adequate to maintain life. Yet life will be long enough for each spirit, and each body will qualify for resurrection. Those who believe that our bodies are nothing more than the result of evolutionary chance will feel no accountability to God or anyone else for what they do with or to their body. We who have a witness of the broader reality of pre-mortal, mortal, and post-mortal eternity, however, must acknowledge that we have a duty to God with respect to this crowning achievement of His physical creation. In Paul's words, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Acknowledging these truths in the direction of President Thomas S. Monson in last April's General Conference, we would certainly not deface our body as with tattoos or debilitate it as with drugs or defile it as with fornication, adultery, or immodesty. As the instrument of our spirit, it is vital that we care for this body as best we can. We should consecrate its powers to serve and further the work of Christ. Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God.
Jesus demonstrated that a consecrated life is a life of service. Hours before his, the agony of His Atonement began, the Lord humbly washed His disciples' feet, saying to them, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Those who quietly and thoughtfully go about doing good offer a model of consecration. No one in our time more perfectly incorporates this trait into daily life than President Thomas S. Monson. He has cultivated a listening ear that can discern even the faintest whisper of the Spirit signaling the need of someone he can reach and help. Often it is in simple acts that confirm divine love and awareness, but always, always Thomas Monson responds. I find in the life of my grandfather and grandmother, Alexander DeWitt and Louise Vickery Christofferson, an instance of such consecration. Grandpa was a strong man and was good at shearing sheep in the days before electric clippers. He got good enough, he said, that in one day I sheared 287 sheep and could have sheared over 300, but we ran out of sheep. <laughs> During 1919, he sheared over 12,000 sheep, earning some $2,000. The money would have substantially expanded his farm and upgraded his home, but a call to serve in the Southern States Mission came from the Brethren, and with Louise's full support, he accepted. He left his wife, then pregnant with their first son, my father, and their three daughters with the sheep-shearing money. Upon his joyous return two years later, he observed, Our savings had lasted us throughout the two years and we had $29 left. A consecrated life is a life of integrity. We see it in the husband and wife who honor marital vows with complete fidelity. We see it in the father and mother whose demonstrated first priority is to nourish their marriage and ensure the physical and spiritual welfare of their children. We see it in those who are honest. Years ago, I became acquainted with two families in the process of dissolving a jointly owned commercial enterprise. The principals, two men who were friends and members of the same Christian congregation, had formed the company years earlier. They had a generally congenial relationship as business partners, but as they grew older and the next generation began to take part in the business, conflicts emerged. Finally, all parties decided it would be best to divide up the assets and go their separate ways. One of the two original partners devised a stratagem with his lawyers to secure for himself a significant financial advantage in the dissolution at the expense of the other partner and his sons. In a meeting of the parties, one of the sons complained about this unfair treatment and appealed to the honor and Christian beliefs of the first partner. You know this is not right, he said. How could you take advantage of someone this way, especially a brother in the same church? The first partner's lawyer retorted, Oh, grow up. How can you be so naive? Integrity is not naivete. What is naive is to suppose that we are not accountable to God. The Savior declared, My Father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross that as I have been lifted up by men, even so should men be lifted up by the Father to stand before me to be judged of their works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. One who lives a consecrated life does not seek to take advantage of another, but if anything will turn the other cheek, and if required to deliver his coat, will give his cloak also. The Savior's sternest rebukes were to hypocrites. Hypocrisy is terribly destructive, not only to the hypocrite, but to those who observe or know of his conduct, especially children. It is faith-destroying, whereas honor is the rich soil in which the seed of faith thrives. 
A consecrated life is a beautiful thing. Its strength and serenity are as a very fruitful tree which is planted in a goodly land by a pure stream that yieldeth much precious fruit. Of particular significance is the influence of a consecrated man or woman upon others, especially those closest and dearest. The consecration of many who have gone before us and others who live among us has helped lay the foundation for our happiness. In like manner, future generations will take courage from your consecrated life, acknowledging their debt to you for the possession of all that truly matters. May we consecrate ourselves as sons and daughters of God, that when He shall appear we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is, that we may have this hope, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
We are grateful to the Tabernacle Choir and their conductors and organists for the beautiful music they have provided this morning. Our concluding speaker at this session will be President Dieter F. Uchtdorf, second counselor in the First Presidency. Following President Uchtdorf's remarks, the choir will sing, the morning breaks. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Eduardo Gavaret of the Seventy, and the conference will be adjourned until 2 o'clock this afternoon, President Uchtdorf. It's remarkable how much we can learn about life by studying nature. For example, scientists can look at the rings of trees and make educated guesses about climate and growing conditions hundreds and even thousands of years ago. One of the things we learn from studying the growth of trees is that during seasons when conditions are ideal, trees grow at a normal rate. However, during seasons where growing conditions are not ideal, trees slow down their growth and devote their energy to the basic elements necessary for survival. At this point, some of you may be thinking, that's all very fine and good, but what does it have to do with flying an airplane? <laughs> well, well, let me tell you. <laughs> have you ever been in an airplane and experienced turbulence? The most common cause of turbulence is a sudden change in air movement, causing the aircraft to pitch, yaw, and roll. While planes are built to withstand far greater turbulence than anything you would encounter on a regular flight, it still may be disconcerting to passengers. What do you suppose pilots do when they encounter turbulence? A student pilot may think that increasing speed is a good strategy because it will get them through the turbulence faster. But that may be the wrong thing to do. Professional pilots understand that there's an optimum turbulence penetration speed that will minimize the negative effects of turbulence. And most of the time, that would mean to reduce your speed. As we all know, the same principle applies also to speed bumps on a road. <laughs> Therefore, it is good advice to slow down a little, steady the course, and focus on the essentials when experiencing adverse conditions. This is a simple but critical lesson to, lesson to learn. It may seem logical when put in terms of trees or turbulence, but it's surprising how easy it is to ignore when it comes to applying these same principles in our own daily lives. When stress levels rise, when distress appears, when tragedy strikes, too often we attempt to keep up the same frantic pace or even accelerate thinking somehow that the more rushed our pace, the better off we will be. One of the characteristics of modern life seems to be that we are moving at an ever-increasing rate regardless of turbulence or obstacles. Let's be honest, it's rather easy to be busy. We all can think of a list of tasks that will overwhelm our schedule. Some might even think that their self-worth depends on the length of their to-do list. They flood the open spaces in their time with lists of meetings and minutia, even during times of stress and fatigue, because they unnecessarily complicate their lives. They often feel 
increase frustration, diminish joy, and too little sense of meaning in their lives. It is said that any virtue, when taken to an extreme, can become a vice. Overscheduling our days would certainly qualify for this. There comes a point where milestones can become millstones and ambitions albatrosses around our neck. The wise understand and apply the lessons of tree rings and turbulence. They resist the temptation to get caught up in the frantic rush of everyday life. They follow the advice, there's more to life than increasing its speed. In short, they focus on the things that matter most. Elder Dallin H. Oaks, in a recent general conference, taught we have to forego some good things in order to choose others that are better or best because they develop faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and strengthen our families. The search for the best things inevitably leads to the foundational principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The simple and beautiful truths revealed to us by a caring, eternal, and all-knowing Father in heaven. These core doctrines and principles, though simple enough for a child to understand, provide the answers to the most complex questions of life. There is a beauty and clarity that comes from simplicity that we sometimes do not appreciate in our thirst for intricate solutions. For example, it wasn't long after astronauts and cosmonauts orbited the Earth that they realized ballpoint pens would not work in space. And so, some very smart people went to work solving the problem. It took thousands of hours and millions of dollars, but in the end, they developed a pen that would write anywhere, in any temperature, and on nearly any surface. But how did the astronauts and cosmonauts get along until the problem was solved? Well, they simply used a pencil. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci is quoted as saying that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. When we look at the foundational principles of the plan of happiness, the plan of salvation, we can recognize and appreciate in its plainness and simplicity the elegance and beauty of our Heavenly Father's wisdom. Then, turning our ways to His ways is the beginning of our wisdom. The story is told that the legendary football coach, Vince Lombardi, had a ritual he performed on the first day of training. He would hold up a football, show it to the athletes who had been playing the sports for many years, and say, gentlemen, this is a football. He talked about its size and shape, how it can be kicked, carried, and passed. He took the team out onto the empty field and said, this is a football field. He walked them around, describing the dimensions, the shape, the rules, and how the, games, the game is played. This coach knew that even these experienced players, and indeed the team, could only become great by mastering the fundamentals. They could spend time practicing intricate trick plays. But until they mastered the fundamentals of the game, they would never become a championship team. I think most of us intuitively understand how important the fundamentals are. It is just that we sometimes get distracted by so many things that seem more enticing. Printed material, wide-ranging media sources, electronic tools and gadgets, all helpful if used properly, can become 
hurtful diversions or heartless chambers of isolation. Yet amidst the multitude of voices and choices, the humble man of Galilee stands with hands outstretched, waiting. His is a simple message, come, follow me. And he does not speak with a powerful megaphone, but with a still, small voice. It is so easy for the basic gospel message to get lost amidst the deluge of information that hits us from all sides. The Holy Scriptures and the spoken word of the living prophets give emphasis to the fundamental principles and doctrines of the gospel. The reason we return to these foundational principles, to the pure doctrine, <coughs> is because they are the gateway to truth of profound meaning. <coughs> they are <coughs> the door to experience and to experiences of sublime importance that would otherwise be beyond our capacity to comprehend. These simple basic principles are the key to living in harmony with God and man. They are the keys to opening the windows of heaven. They lead us to the peace, joy, and understanding that Heavenly Father has promised to his children who hear and obey him. My dear brothers and sisters, we would do well to slow down a little, proceed at the optimum speed for our circumstances, focus on the significant, lift up our eyes, and truly see the things that matter most. Let us be mindful of the foundational precepts our Heavenly Father has given to his children that will establish the basis of a rich and fruitful mortal life with promises of eternal happiness. They will teach us to do all these things in wisdom and order, for it is not requisite that we should run faster than we have strength. But it is expedient that we should be diligent and thereby win the prize. My dear brothers and sisters, diligently doing the things that matter most will lead us to the Savior of the world. This is why we talk of Christ. We rejoice in Christ. We preach of Christ. We prophesy of Christ. That we may know to what source we may look for remission of our sins. In the complexity, confusion, and rush of modern living, this is the more excellent way. So what are the basics? As we turn to our Heavenly Father and seek His wisdom regarding the things that matter most, we learn over and over again the importance of four key relationships with our God, with our families, with our fellow men, and with ourselves. As we evaluate our own lives with a willing mind, we will see where we have drifted from the more excellent way. The eyes of our understanding will be opened, and we will recognize what needs to be done to purify our heart and refocus our life. First, our relationship with God is most sacred and vital. We are His spirit children. He is our Father. He desires our happiness. As we seek Him, as we learn of His Son, Jesus Christ, as we open our hearts to the influence of the Holy Ghost, our lives become more stable and secure. We experience greater peace joy, and fulfillment as we give our best to live according to God's eternal plan and keep His commandments. We improve our relationship with our Heavenly Father by learning of Him, by communing with Him, 
by repenting of our sins and actively following Jesus Christ, for no man cometh unto the Father but by Christ. To strengthen our relationship with God, we need some meaningful time alone with him, quietly focusing on daily personal prayer and scripture study, always aiming to be worthy of a current temple recommend. These will be some wise investments of our time and efforts to draw closer to our Heavenly Father. Let us heed the psalmist's invitation, be still and know that I am God. Our second key relationship is with our families. Since no other success can compensate for failure here, we must place high priority on our families. We build deep and loving family relationships by doing simple things together, like family dinner and family home evening, and by just having fun together. In family relationships, love is really spelled T-I-M-E, time. Taking time for each other is the key for harmony at home. We talk with rather than about each other. We learn from each other and we appreciate our differences as well as our commonalities. We establish a divine bond with each other as we approach God together through family prayer, gospel study, and Sunday worship. The third key relationship we have is with our fellow men. We build this relationship one person at a time by being sensitive to the needs of others serving them and giving of our time and talents. I was deeply impressed by one sister who was burdened with the challenges of age and illness, but decided that although she couldn't do much, she could listen. And so each week she watched for people who looked troubled or discouraged, and she spent time with them listening. What a blessing she was in the lives of so many people. The fourth key relationship is with ourselves. It may seem odd to think of having a relationship with ourselves, but we do. Some people can't get along with themselves. <laughs> they criticize and belittle them themselves all day long until they begin to hate themselves. May I suggest that you reduce the rush and take a little extra time to get to know yourself better. Walk in nature, watch the sunrise, enjoy God's creations, ponder the truths of the restored gospel, and find out what they mean for you personally. Learn to see yourself as Heavenly Father sees you, as his precious daughter or son with divine potential. Brothers and sisters, let us be wise. Let us turn to the pure doctrinal waters of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us joyfully partake of them in their simplicity and plainness. The heavens are open again. The gospel of Jesus Christ is on earth once more. And its simple truths are a plentiful source of joy. Brothers and sisters, indeed, we have great reason to rejoice. If life in its rushed pace and many stresses have made it difficult for you to feel like rejoicing, then perhaps now is a good time to refocus on what matters most. Strength comes not from frantic activity, but from being settled on a firm foundation of truth and light. It comes from placing our attention and efforts on the basics of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. It comes from paying attention to the divine things that matter most. Let us simplify our lives a little. Let us make the changes necessary to refocus our lives on the sublime beauty of the simple, humble path of Christian discipleship, the path that leads always toward a life of meaning, gladness, and peace. For this I pray, as I leave you my blessing, in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
our dear Father in heaven. At the end of this first session of this general conference, we are so grateful for the spirit that we felt through this beautiful music and these inspired messages. We express our gratitude for our Savior and Redeemer and for his sacrifice for us. Oh God, thanks for a prophet, even President Thomas S. Monson. And we ask thy blessing upon him and upon his counselors and upon the member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Thanks, Father, for the counsel that we receive from thee. And we ask thy blessing, thy help to put them in practice. Help, Father, to become our brother's keeper, following the example of our Savior and the example of our prophet. We are so grateful for the new temples that were announced. Father, before we leave, we ask thy blessing, that this spirit that we felt during this session be upon us so we can say, we can express as a commitment and say, thy will I will do and thy words I will keep. In the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. This has been the first session of the 180th semi-annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.